2020 was a huge year for IPOs. $170 billion has been raised, and that is the most ever. 89 billions in, IPO, in IPOs of operating companies, $81 billion worth of special purpose acquisition companies or blank check vehicles. Compare that to 2019's US IPO market, which raised over $46 billion for 160 companies. And SPACs have come out of obscurity. In 2019, 59 SPACs raised $13.6 billion. Three of the largest tech IPOs ever, Snowflake, Airbnb, and DoorDash, all occurred in 2020. Palantir, a seven-time CNBC disruptor, had one of the biggest direct listings of 2020. So when you look at the traditional IPO underwritten process, it really is focused around the bank and the institutional investors that are positioned to get that uh, first day pop because they pay large fees to the banks, right? And, and we really wanted a lot of people to share in as much as they could. However, grabbing stock before an IPO is reserved mostly for VIP investors. Some of the firms who have more retail distribution are going to make sure that some of their high net worth clients have access to these IPOs, but primarily it is an institutional market. This separation between retail and institutional investors gives more fire to the idea that Americans increasingly see the stock market as a barometer just for the rich, not the whole economy. Also, company valuations have led to massive price pops on the first year of trading, which make banks and institutional investors a lot of money. If you make that much money that quickly, it might be time to kind of rein it back in. Yeah, look, I mean, I don't want to say that the market is broken, but the process of how we're doing these deals is definitely broken. And a new rule from the SEC that affects direct listings is being called by some as the end of the traditional IPO. So is the IPO market broken? And are all these alternatives to traditional IPOs helping or hurting retail investors? An initial public offering, or IPO, is when a company sells the first shares of stock in the public markets, so they can raise money to grow the business. Going public is now more about accessing liquidity. Going public is less about raising capital, but more about creating a, a currency that can be used to pay for acquisitions, or as a currency, hire employees, or give liquidity to existing employees or investors. When a private business has grown to a place where the small number of initial investors are willing to give up some of their stake in the company in order to grow the business, a company will start talking about going public. As we got deeper and deeper uh, into thinking about it, it was clear we had reached a size and reached a scale where not being public was a hindrance. And you can really see that today, sort of the fact that we're public, the transparency that it brings to, to our customers, to our potential customers uh, is really is really, really valuable. And you can see it sort of, you see it in the go to market. Uh, and, and so it's been a massive, massive impact on the business being public that I think we didn't even fully appreciate uh, until we were out on the other side of it. The most common ways are traditional IPOs, direct listings, and SPACs, also known as blank check companies. Companies are staying private for longer because of a rule change in the Jobs Act of 2012, which allowed a company to stay private with 2,000 shareholders up from 500 before the law. If we look back 20 years ago, uh, companies with over $500 million of market value really had no choice but to go public if they wanted additional capital, if they wanted liquidity for their founders. Today, there is a choice, and it's a choice to, to go with private capital instead. And because of that avenue, you've seen a shrinkage of the public markets. Once the private company decides to undertake an IPO, the company must prepare to function as a public company does, which means increased transparency to protect investors. To do this, companies typically hire an investment bank or several banks to be the underwriters and help with that process, which can take anywhere from four months to over a year. Public investors are demanding and there's not a lot of room for error. So there's an awful lot of preparation. A private company can get away with not having that oversight, and that's fine. But once you get into ready to go public, you need to be prepared with audited financials that uh, investors can trust. The banks are also tasked with creating the company's prospectus. The prospectus, or Form S1, has all sorts of information on the company, its managers, ownership structure, financials, and risks associated with the stock. The final product will be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission and published on the SEC's Edgar database. To generate excitement about the offering, the company and the underwriters will go on a roadshow to pitch the company to different institutional investors, hedge funds, and analysts to see how much investors would be willing to pay. I mean, every IPO did a remote roadshow, has done a remote, remote roadshow since March. 
I think there's probably maybe one or two IPOs in the world that have done <laughs> remote road shows up before March. The underwriting fees are the most expensive part of the IPO process. It can cost anywhere from $2 million to more than $170 million, depending on the size of the company and the IPO. For a company to go through um, an IPO process takes uh, a very long time uh, and uh, a lot of uh, compliance, legal and banking fees. So it is it is a it is an expensive uh, uh, process uh, to begin with. Once the SEC approves of the IPO by declaring it effective, the offering price and the number of shares to be issued can be set by the underwriter and the issuing company, and they can finally turn that initial investment from the roadshow into buy orders. Approval from the SEC doesn't necessarily deem that this is this is something that's safe and that you should be investing in, or this is the right investment for you. Right. So I think that's an evaluation that you need to do as an investor um, and really kind of look through whatever your metrics are to define whether this makes sense or not. Figuring out what the offering price of shares to underwriters and institutional investors is when valuations come in. To get to that offering price, underwriters look at the company's competitors, the prospects for growth, and even a company's history to determine the price. Valuation is really meant to be driven by the fundamentals of the company. And so if you look at its you know, revenue, you look at its earnings estimates uh, going forward, uh, and reasonable growth rates, you will usually get to some kind of a future valuation target that makes some sense. However, in markets, you have another element to valuation, which is forward expectations. Choosing the exchange to list at is one of the easiest choices companies have to make now. Historically, companies would look at which exchanges would be better suited for their specific situation and look at the exchange's trading costs and liquidity options. But because markets are mostly electronic now, there is very little difference in those aspects. The Internet of Things, the, the, the development of you know how the market has worked has changed this process significantly over the years, but I would liken it more to what type of firm are you and where are you best positioned? or opportunity and growth. We were optimizing uh, on speed and, and, and being able to, to tell our story. And so I, I think when you think about NYC, NASDAQ, I think they're both, you know, great exchanges. Uh, and, and frankly, both could, uh, you know, handle a, a direct listing well. NYC has, has uh, at, at our time, had done the, the major ones to date. And so that's sort of why we went that route. However, because the stock is listed in one exchange does not mean that it can't be traded in another. And many are. In order for an IPO to be successful, people have to want the shares being issued by the company. The more demand, the higher the price of a stock can be. And companies usually try to time the IPO for when the demand is highest. 2020 saw some big pops in the first day of trading. Of the companies I looked at, a record number, like a third of the companies popped at least 50% um, on the first day of trading. So um, that's, that's a very high number. That historically has been between 15 to 20%. About 15 to 20 percent of companies tend to have a first day pop of more than 50 percent, um, whereas this time we saw almost double. In December 2020, DoorDash and Airbnb grew 86 and 112 percent respectively from their offering price on the first day of trading. But the issuing companies are not the ones raking in those profits. The winners really are the bankers who are collecting fees uh, and the institutional investors or ultra high net worth investors um, who have pocketed the difference between the IPO price um, and whatever the retail euphoria price is. Analysts have suggested that the IPO pricing process is somehow broken because the investment banks could underprice IPOs, leaving a lot of money on the table and not taking into account the amount of young retail investors. In 2018, it was six billion. In 2019, it was seven billion. This year, it's going to be over $34 billion in one day giveaways. Usually, shares are underpriced to ensure that the shares are oversubscribed or that they will sell and to create stability. But that means that most retail investors are not usually involved in the IPO process, as typically about 85% of a company's shares during an IPO are sold to institutional investors. That means that individual investors, they're really not going to have much access, if at all, to the shares before they start trading. This creates a sort of euphoria with retail investors who want to get in early on the action. With these big pops in the first day of trading, retail investors can be left waiting for a long time to make a profit. That means that you have essentially transferred wealth from retail money to either ultra high net worth or institutional money. Um, and, and that retail money then has to wait sometimes a decade before they really make money on that investment.
Alternatives to the traditional model have become more widespread, as companies look to get in on IPOs without all the regulatory red tape. 2020 was dubbed the year of the SPAC by multiple outlets, and analysts say that the boom will continue in 2021. In fact, SPACs in 2021 have already beat 2019 levels. This is a capital intensive business, and, and funding is, is critical to winning that race. SPAC got us there quicker, right? The conventional IPO uh, process, very cumbersome, long, expensive. So this was a a much easier route. SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company and is basically a shell company that works kind of in the reverse of a traditional IPO by raising capital first through the IPO and then acquiring or merging with a company, usually within two years. They're also called blank check deals because the shell company doesn't have a formal business, but will usually pick a sector they want to get into. There are a lot of different companies that are, are in kind of emerging segments that have, have been able to uh, use this way of raising money to get on the board, get their stock listed, raise capital, and go from essentially a, a capital restrained company to a company that all of a sudden has quite a bit of liquidity. According to SPAC Insider, 2020 saw 248 SPACs go public, with an average IPO size of almost $335 million. That was a huge gain from 2019, when 59 SPACs took in an average of $231 million. Stacks have been so popular that even Shaquille O'Neal has one. It's raised $300 million to acquire a company in media, tech, or the telecom world. It's a very expensive process because it's an IPO plus a merger document. It's an IPO with a lot of leverage, which means that the companies themselves have to succeed. Leverage makes failure come more quickly. If you have a downturn in earnings and you have no leverage, you can reduce your expenses and you can ride it out. If you have a downturn in earnings and you have these fixed you know, costs that you have to pay because you have excess leverage on your company, it means that you will very quickly run out of cash. Because more companies are looking at alternatives to the traditional IPO, in November 2019, the New York Stock Exchange proposed allowing companies to raise fresh capital in direct listings. After over a year of haggling, the SEC approved the rule in December 2020. The new rule would allow companies to issue new shares and sell them on the first day of trading. Everyone's on a level playing field. I mean, what's really great about it is it democratizes access to that, that public listing on the exchange the first day of trading. Before the new rule, companies would go public through a direct listing after filing their prospectus with the SEC, like a traditional IPO. But instead of selling new shares, private shareholders would be able to sell their shares in the public markets. Companies would do it this way if they had enough cash on hand to avoid diluting the shares already in place and to avoid the lockup period of six months when insiders can't sell in the open markets. We had a, a strong balance sheet. You know, we, we went The day we went public, we had 1.8 billion uh, on, on the balance sheet. We really wanted a lot of people to share in as much as they could. The direct listing is a huge amount of work, right? Really, when you think about a direct listing, a lot of the work um, that a bank normally does in an IPO is it, it, put on the company. Uh, and, and so really, we had a team that was well positioned to do it. It's about the cost of capital. If they sell shares the night before to a group of investors without having all investor interest as part of that offering, they're going to likely sell it at a lower price than what the market demand might be. You know, you're just not getting the full view of what all interest is. The new rule would also allow companies to raise money on the New York Stock Exchange without paying such big underwriting fees to Wall Street banks. And some analysts are saying that it will be the end of the traditional IPO as we know it. The Nasdaq is also trying to do the same thing. In the future, you'll be able to go on Robinhood, and if you want to participate in an IPO, you can. Um, and then let's not let these intermediaries and gatekeepers hand allocate who gets this underpriced stock. But there's always two sides to a coin, right? So it's really evaluating what you're investing in, what you know, what what your uh, investment philosophy is, what your metrics that you abide by, um, because I think it's it's important to to still in in part that discipline on your investment strategy. Anything that, that you know the SEC and others can do that encourage companies to be public while at the same time making the focus of it and, and around sort of not just the banks and the, institu the institutional investors that are gonna really benefit from that first day pop, but you know, making more people able to share in that, I, I think is a, is a really good thing. As the landscape changes, companies may try to work around rules and regulations. When the SEC presents regulation, Inevitably, there will be yet another invention in the market to sidestep that regulation. The greatest challenge um, to IPOs is that they create 
they create FOMO. They create fear of missing out. Many times those retail investors have really not done the homework to understand the price they pay versus the price that that company is capable of given long-term growth rates. And more often than not, you know, IPOs actually underperform for a period of years uh, while the company goes through its growing pains.